Well, since it's officially 4.30, I'm just uh, going to welcome everyone who's already here and just suggest that we wait another minute or two as people still are filtering in before we uh, really start this last session. Um, but we will start in just a, in a minute. All right, I think we should uh, get rolling. Um, welcome everybody to the last session of this year's Connected Learning Summit. Uh, I'm Scott Osterweil uh, from MIT, one of the, and Learning Games Network, one of the um, organizers of this. And uh, Eric Klopfer from MIT and I will be uh, sort of doing the closing bits. So, um, which of course, we wanna thank everybody who's attending for having made, this, uh, what we think is another successful conference. We hope so, but you will actually tell us because you can uh, fill out the survey and let us know how it how it went for you. Um, we have, in our conversations, we really are thinking that this is going to continue to be an online conference for the foreseeable future. But those of you who attended the open session also saw Mimi's presentation about the, the, the mini conferences that are happening on sites at different locations. So keep uh, watching for those as well. Um, and of course, we have a lot of people to thank the, the organizations that, that, that have hosted this conference. We're not gonna read all the thank yous out loud, but we can let you all take it in. Um, and of course, the facilities and presenters, um, you know, made a huge difference in the way this conference went. So thank you to everybody who participated um, in making this work and, uh, Thanks to the committee, the organizing committee. And especially to the staff. I mean, those of us who, um, who've who been involved in this conference over the years know that uh, there's a whole lot of stuff happening behind the scenes. Um, we couldn't show up and do our jobs well if, 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 the, if these people weren't working all year round on making this work. And so uh, a real big thanks to them. Um, an amazing group, so. And um, also volunteers. I mean, one of the things that we've been inspired by is the number of um, younger people who've been stepping up both as presenters and as volunteers. Um, needless to say, uh, we want we want there to be generational churn. We don't want just all of us seasoned vets doing all the work. And so we really appreciate um, the work that the volunteers have been doing to help make this make this run. And we look forward to them eventually sort of running the show. And with that, I'll turn turn it over to Eric for the for our uh, summit awards. So. Thanks. We have uh, we have four awards to give out this year and we have four presenters to give out those awards. Um, and these are all people who have made amazing contributions um, either this year or or for many years um, to the CLS community. Um, and we were thrilled that we get a chance to, to recognize them. So we'll have different presenters for each of these sort of who are involved in different ways in, um, in uh, helping to provide these awards to the, to the wonderful deserving recipients of them. Oops. Hi everyone, I'm Rick Rose Roque. I'm excited to present the Best Research Paper Award to Laura Kowalti, and along with um, their collaborators, Carolina Ochoa, Vanessa Bermudez, Ubichu, Santiago Ahera Ramirez, and Kylie Papler for their paper, Facilitating Connected Learning PD. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm going to pass it over to, I think, Scott. Yeah. Hi, Scott, here again, just for the Community Stewardship Award, which is going to uh, our colleague at MIT, Jalisa Trapp, for enduring leadership and caring cultivation growing and broadening the connected learning community. And anyone who's participated in the Rising Scholar event that we've been doing for the last two years 
knows how uh, it's essential Jalisa has been to this. She's just been a wonderful, uh, wonderful contributor. And again, uh, those of us who've been around the block a few times really appreciate when, you know, someone as young as Jalisa steps up and does as much as she's done. So thanks so much, Jalisa. Is, is Jalisa here? And just wants to yeah, say, I'm here. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure you had a chance to say, say hello. Yeah. Next up. Uh, it's my honor to present the Beacon of Innovation Award to Katie Salen, who's been a personal inspiration for me, I think, my whole career. No pressure, Katie, just high expectations. And she was uh, nominated for this and received it for expanding our imagination of how games and online communities can support learning, spark joy, and foster equity. Well earned. Congratulations, Katie. Thank you so much, Drew. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Claudia Caro, and I have the pleasure of... Um, um, awarding the presenting the award walking the talk award to Nicole Pinkard and uh, this is in recognition to her outstanding leadership and unwavering commitment to advancing the field of digital media and learning we proudly present this award um, to Nicole her visionary leadership has been the driving force behind our collective efforts to transform education and inspire innovation in the digital age. Uh, Nicole's remarkable contributions have not only jumpstarted the digital media and learning initiatives under the MacArthur Foundation, but have also ignited a passion for exploration, create creativity, and lifelong learning in countless individuals such as myself. Um, her vision has transcended boundaries and enriched the landscape of education. With her dedication and pioneering spirit, Nicole has not only creating a lasting legacy, but has also been an inspiration to us all. Her work embodies the values of innovation, collaboration, and a steadfast commitment to the pursuit of knowledge. So this award serves as a small talk token of our deepest appreciation um, for Nicole's transformative impact on digital media and learning, and as a symbol, our of our collective gratitude for her extraordinary leadership. I love you, Nicole. Thank you. A wonderful award and a wonderful presentation. Um, I'll also point out that there were physical um, awards that people will be getting um, that were produced uh, by Cindy Howe, Nikki Yankova, and Kylie Pepler. Um, which you can see here on the screen here. Uh, these are, uh, we, these, this is a picture of them. I don't know if this is a picture of a digital version or a virtual version, but these are actually physical objects that you can get in the real world that they will receive. Um, and we're thankful to that group for, for creating these wonderful awards. And thanks for all the committees um, that, that helped, you know, really uh, choose some really wonderful recipients for these awards. Um, so with that, I am thrilled um, to introduce our closing keynote. Um, Diana Nucera, otherwise known as Mother Cyborg, who will be talking about surveillance, data collection, the redaction of love, and the complexity of identity. Um, I won't read her whole bio here, but I'll point out some, some parts of this. Um, Mother Cyborg's work opens up analog and tactile spaces for audiences to reflect upon our collective relationship with internet technologies, identity, legacy, and future. She draws from over 16 years of experience as a community organizer in Detroit, where individuals gained access and agency to rebuild their neighborhoods and run their own internet service providers. Her work brings poetry, music, fiber arts, and the power of emotional connections together alongside personal experience and systemic analysis. In 2019, Diana was uh, recognized with the Kresge Arts Literary Fellowship in 2021. She became a United States Arts Artist Fellow in Media. And in 2022, she was awarded a Knight Arts and Tech Fellowship as well as a Rockefeller Bellagio Fellowship. So we're thrilled to have her here, to, her here today, and I will stop sharing and let her take it away. Oh, wow, it's so nice to be with you all. Thank you so much for having me. I just wanna make sure that the slides are um, good. If someone can give me just a thumbs up. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Wow, um, to be a keynote is so uh, such an honor um, for this group of people, so thank you. But to also be a part 
of an award ceremony is even more exciting. I low-key love award ceremonies. So congratulations to everybody um, who just received those because that's it's always special when you, um, your community recognizes your work. So um, just to get started, I am here to talk to you about the state of the digital world, hopefully connect it to some of the chaos we're all experiencing with technology and war at the moment. Um, and then look at how craft and quilts can like, um, and art can be used as a avenue of evidence and understanding even within the digital realm. So I'll first by start by just sharing a deep philosophy of mine, um, which informs all of the work that I do. And this work, uh, this particular philosophy came through the work I did uh, working with Detroiters and uh, dealing with digital redlining here. Um, and so technology and the internet, I believe have the ability to transform our communities, assist in economic development, and help residents understand and utilize the power they already have. And I know it's unique to have a really hopeful and like liberatory view on technology when communities of color, indigenous communities, and also activist communities have been really harmed by technology. But I've also seen it really support work. Um, and so after organizing this conference at uh, the Allied Media Conference for years, I'll never forget the first time I witnessed the power of technology when I saw this group of young black artists and media makers do a Skype um, with young Palestinian uh, art and media makers. And they did the solidarity Skype across apartheid borders um, in 2008. And it was the first time, I mean, Skype at the time was very new, um, but I saw the power of that as a connective tool, even in the midst of violence and apartheid that like it shaped everything that I do moving forward in understanding the potential of technology. So I wanted to give you that context and it felt very um, poignant at this moment considering that particular struggle continues. And so to meditate on like, how do you get people to start thinking about technology in a really, really critical way so that they can come to this place of seeing it as a liberatory tool. Um, after years of organizing, I realized that education is at the, at the key, it's just the foundation of it all. And the way in which we're teaching technology uh, is very top down. And it doesn't look at what is, what the technology could be used for, it often looks at what the technology is is designed for, or at least this was my experience in Detroit in the early years around 2010 to 2017. So when artificial intelligence first started really popping off in my mind was in 2016, um, and I met my collaborator Mimi Anoa, who's an amazing artist and technologist and writer, and we got together to write this zine called A People's Guide to Artificial Intelligence. It was published in 2018. So this idea of technology becoming and growing into something that could be potentially harmful, but also beneficial is something that I feel like I've been grappling with for such a long time. So this zine goes into a pedagogy of teaching that just really allows people, that focuses on um, critical pedagogy or pedagogy of the oppressed, which is like start where people are at, give them the tools to create and discover and to address the problems that they have. So some a lot of my work currently is is using um, these philosophies and ideas that come from my art and from my organizing to create um, these handbooks, essentially. And a lot of them you can find on my website or also through uh, people's guide to tech dot org. So that's like, well, you know, where where things kind of started in the and moved into more creative realm in the organizing world. But I've always been a musician and an artist, and I actually put that aside to do organizing in Detroit. So organizing was my practice. It was my art practice. And it, it makes so much sense to me now in hindsight how I like moved into more of my artist self, but with such a political viewpoint and something that's like, really based in having tools for people to come to uh, understanding of deep complexities. 
that it really kind of started with this moment in 2017, as I was writing the AI zine, where I started really thinking about how we, science fiction has such a role in how we think about the future and how we think about the potential of technology. Um, and at the time I was teaching so many people, like even just how to use Google Maps from the day they it was it came out to like being able to use Google Docs I mean, or whatever it is people needed to learn to do their work. Um, I was always there teaching them. So the idea of mother cyborg, that concept came to me as something that could embrace not just my art, but my organizing. Um, and so in 2017, I, like music was always my first love. So I released this album that looks deep into um, the, a cyborg coming into consciousness. What happens essentially in the midst of transformation? Like I have always been attracted to this phrase, I transform myself, I transform the world around me. And I wanted to know if that's something that's possible to engage on stage. And so uh, Mother Cyborg, this is her record release. Um, and what I used to do is perform as a very techie kind of weird entity that would bring a humanness to this concept of cyborg because within science fiction, we're often like afraid of the potential of like any technology being close to human form because of our fear of being eradicated and it like just surpassing us. So like this, the, the concepts of the singularity or whatever, like all that stuff is of course incredibly scary, but I'm like, that is one projected future. What if mother cyborg can show like empathy and build kinship with humans and people around technology and bring them into the future with love. Um, and so that's where I've landed is the work that I do now is all based in understanding how do you bring people into the future with love through art while also being very critical of the current state of where the world is at. Okay, so now we're gonna get into some quilts. So this is the main event, like <laughs> we are, um, I, you know, was doing so much performing and, and, and organizing, which is all very much in person. Uh, so when the pandemic hit, it all just kind of went, uh, just like all y'all know, like it, it just took every, turned everything on its head and I had to, to think of a new practice. Um, and so I dove into quilting, um, because it's a it's a practice that I actually um, got from my home because I come from a long line of tailors. And so when I first started thinking about how do you create and use textile or traditional craft in order to create these like analog spaces that allow us to reflect upon our collective relationships with technology, I wanted to first um, dive into identity because the craft itself was so close to my personal um, heritage as it was my mother's craft, I had to come face to face with um, not actually receiving that craft um, through my family and coming to it on my own. So this quilt is called Miss Diso's 404. It was made in 2020. It's um, 86 by 93 inches. So it's like the size of a queen size bed. Um, 404 is a internet protocol that means the place that houses the info you are seeking online has been located, but your access has been denied. And I'm looking at this protocol through family, legacy, and identity. Um, and mestizos is a word that describes someone who is mixed race, especially one having Spanish or indigenous descent, of which I do. Um, and so for me, this piece is about for being a first generation and how assimilating really destroys ancestry. Um, and it also goes into thinking about using traditional Mexican fabrics, how above the border, we're all Mexican, even though I come from a Colombian um, home, I always had to adapt to whatever um, Latin culture was around me. So there's so many instances in which this internet protocol <laughs> makes so much sense to me as um, just like uh, coming from an immigrant family. 
Um, so, cause, so this quilt is about not knowing it's about how to belong and making your way with instinct, um, curiosity and, and self-love. And I, I bring this into the space because um, oftentimes we think about the digital world and the analog world as completely separate. Um, and it's just not like we are all super deeply connected to the information that we both create and consume online. And it does affect our analog world and our relationships that we have. So making diving into um, this through identity was very helpful for me to sort of really unpack that to create works in, in the future um, that go more into the political nature of technology. And in this quote, you'll see that there are, it's really rough because um, it, 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 it has these like parts in which are just sewn together um, in, a, in a very like uh, rough way to, to, to also acknowledge the journey of having to like work with your mistakes. And so that's 404 Mestizos. So going from there really led me into unpacking identity and also this relationship with home um, and how art can then be used as a way of, of, of knowledge creation, but maybe experience creation as well. So I am a misfit. I'm a queer woman of color that comes from a very conservative family that did not um, accept my lifestyle. So I have a very robust queer family and um, am always grappling with this sort of unacceptance, um, which again, the 404 protocol makes so, so much sense to me because of that. It's like, all this information, genetic information, historical information, ancestral information is there, but like I literally don't have access to it. So 404 Mom um, is about the lack of family and ancestry and history that comes within a, with assimilation. Um, and then with this quilt, I'm creating my own legacy, sort of embedding the stories and lesson that I've gathered through my lifetime for the future. And through making these quilts, I'm like able to see the complexity of the world and distinct them, the shame, distinct, have a distinction between shame and trauma that lingers from my mother's immigration story. And so this quilt is a con the conversation that we never were able to have. And all my quilts are really bright and shiny, even the sad ones. I know these are sad. I promise you I'm getting into funner ones. Um, but I wanted to just show the, the way in which art and technology can create this analog portal to really think through the deeper relationships we have with each other, but also with the like technologies, even if it is just through metaphor. So it was interesting because I wasn't able to get into any political work until I sussed through all of that. And I think it's because the craft itself just is a, an inherent craft around healing, around organizing, um, and around language. Um, so for me, in using traditional craft and bringing bright colors to examine the complex issues of technology, like I really, really want to open up these analog spaces that allow to reflect, you know, on all this complexity. So uh, back in the day, I was working a lot on um, just data um, collection, but as well as like thinking through privacy and security. Um, and I started reading Shoshana Zuboff's um, uh, Surveillance Capital, Age of Surveillance Capital's book, as well as Simone Brown's Dark Matters book, kind of simultaneously. And so this quilt series that I'm going to show you is like really impacted by those both works of literature. And um, I started what this one called uh, Encrypt Me, because um, this this one, after reading Shoshana's book, I was like, oh my God, the world, what is happening? We live in a surveillance state, no one knows. And it felt like I was like deep in a conspiracy theory. Um, and so these these quotes like helped me like unpack what was happening. Um, so this one examines the peaceful nature of privacy and security tactics used to protect consumers from surveillance. 
tools like email encryption or like VPNs and firewalls, um, to me, they're all individual band-aids and they fail to address the systemic nature of our collective surveillance problem. And because technologies of extraction are like so deeply embedded in our lives and gadgets and data economies continue to grow unchecked and really feed the AI like craze that's happening out right now and also give is what gave us um, the artificial moment we're in right now because of the amount of data we have. I feel like it just it just feels like the concept of privacy or security is like anarchy like there's. Like, I think this blanket might be a little more, um, give you more protection than some of the gadgets that we use. So this quote looks at the this individual problem or this, this collective problem that's looked at individually. It is um, uh, a really small quilt that has basically my encryption key embroidered on there. Um, and it also has uh, the, what's a railroad, um, quilt block, which was used a lot in uh in the Underground Railroad, um, in order to say like this is a a, a you're at a passing point. So you, there's like you're sort of at a fork in the road. So I love how like the colloquialness of quilts and how the image there's already a built-in visual imagery um or language to work with. Um, and there's also lots of room to project more stories on it. Okay. So then that moved into really thinking through data um, and the way in which it's collected. Uh, so this one's called Infinite Data. It was also made in 2020. It's 36 by 36. And it's the infinite knot, which is a sacred symbol of love. Um, you'll see it in many different cultures um, from Celtic to Hindu to um, Buddhist, there's just like a lot of different moments in which this particular shape shows up in people's culture. And, um, and it's nice because it does like, it does like symbolize love across many languages. Um, and so behind it, you see the ones and zeros, which become a big part of my work in showing that this, this analog object is about technology and, and it also represents the data. Um, so this, for me, the big question that comes from this quilt is how do you fight a system that commodifies love? Because the way in which uh, data is collected, at least through social media, is through hearts, likes, emojis, anything that we express an emotion is like gold. Um, because it, it gives an insight into our, our desires. And essentially, that that's what's being used to sell us things. Um, and so this quote really looks at like, yeah, what do you do when your love is being commodified in the way that you've been given tools to show um, your love for others is, is like almost like a trap. Um, so I do feel like in order to like really understand this, like, and to move from it is that we, you know, need to love in radically different ways. Um, and in order to do that, we have to look at the commodification of love and self-worth that social media nurtures. And, and you'll see like the fabrics start to have a little more significance so that you could, you could get that visual language of this is about surveillance, this is about data. And as cliche as it could be, like I said, I really want to talk about, talk to people who don't usually think about technology, um, but maybe have an entry point of art or craft. So this one, um, the next few I'm gonna show really are processing the past few elections we've had, which I know, I know about you, but like, man, it's going to be an election year, so I'm sure there's going to be another series of these coming out because it's just so wild. I hate election years. Um, but anyways, um, again, made in 2020, just the way that social media played a role in disinformation and the like 
election of Trump was really bananas to me, considering that it was also a tool that Obama used and was one of the main tools in data, in data collection using um, uh, social media as, as a way of understanding what the people wanted. Like, so there was just like two very different uses like of it, but the same, I don't know, I'm still, I'm still processing it all y'all. But anyways, this one's called the platforms are segregating us. And um, this one really, like really just wants us, I wanted to look at um, how platforms both digital or analog segregate us from making it impossible to see each other eye to eye. I feel still incredibly like traumatized from the polarization of the 2020 elections that happened. Um, and I know that social media has been tainted because of that and the role that AI is playing in it now, I feel like is what's giving us um, the fears for the future of tech. So I just needed to take some time to look at it as a shape, like literally you put us on platforms and it's really hard to see eye to eye unless you're on the same level. So I'm so curious about ways in which technology can have us really see each other on a more horizontal field. So I'm just gonna keep going through these. You see the, here's some more, all the chaos of the, the election most recently that we, to deal with. And I just think it's so interesting how like shape can really allow us to see things. And I think that's what I love so much about quilting because it literally is just like triangles and squares that come together to build an emotion or language. And it's the color and the, there are other forms of language that we put in that really like build up what we think about it. So now I'm deep into Shoshana's Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And <laughs> I think I already read it and like had therapy around it. Um, and I was just like, wow, like there's so many, so many things inside of things. Um, like we have data collection from like, maybe we could put a, something on our phone, but then there's an app in there that like might be collecting something anyways, even though we have every other app closed. Like it's very hard to keep up with this concept of like trying not to get surveilled. Um, I think I just don't think about it anymore. Like I just, I'm just like, I refuse to let the tools that I use to love people like be taken from me. Um, and I, 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 I'm, I seek new ways of, of, of protecting myself. Um, but this particular quilt is called the thing inside of the thing. And it looks at the, how the seamless strategies of data collection and flawless designs like really mask the function and extraction as convenience and access. And that, that found that to be like so tricky. It's so tricky to navigate. And these are things inside of things that we use every day that quantify, collect, and extract our moods, decisions, and needs. And it's hard to decipher what we choose and what has chosen us. So in here, you'll start to see these boxes really appear um, the, as the work moves on where, um, sorry, my dog is barking. Um, but as the work moves on, you'll see the boxes are used as like an example of containment or identity um, and how they kind of can symbolize, the symbol of them can go between the two. Um, and so I think the big question I have in making this quilt was, is there a box capable of capturing our self-determination or is that our only weapon against the surveillance state that we have within the technology we use every day? And in person, this quilt is very three-dimensional, um, just to kind of like, it has layers of it so you could really get the effect of things inside of things. Of course, you'll see everything's very shiny. Everything's very bright because I, I think color can play such a role in creating a mood um, and, and creating something like safety um, or just even a tunnel. 
um, for you to stare at because I think that's important because these things are I'm talking about are, are really scary and complex. And um, I think we need more safer spaces to think about them and be vulnerable about them um, because otherwise we go straight to the problem instead of what potential solutions are. So you'll notice that just get brighter and brighter as I go along. And so now um, I thought, okay, we we understand the concept, we understand what's going on. Now let's start looking at the systems of what's happening. Um, so I began, you know, really starting to to think about these ideas around quantification um, of human behavior. I do not understand how parts of our lives can be turned into data, um, which to me makes artificial intelligence like getting as close to feeling like a human feel like almost impossible because of that. Um, and so again, I'm using the boxes in this quilt to represent te technological designs that measure and predict human behavior. So this is like us being boxed. So this quilt's called boxed behavior. Um, think about the algorithms that you have on like Netflix, Spotify, wherever it is. And then you look at someone else's and you're like, wait, what? I didn't know that movie was out because of the kind of box that you get put in um, from like consumer algorithms. And so um, this one definitely looks at that and like how like the multitudes of boxes accumulate to contain our lives. Um, and I often think about how categorization like creates its own structures and like our human impulse to predict. Um, and we always seem to have this like friction with with chaos um, and wanting to like put it into into containment. And I don't I just wonder with this particular quilt to, to what end? To what end do we contain things? Um, and how do we break out of that? Uh, this quilt is like a twin size, so it's fairly big. It does have the ability to kind of suck you in and it's incredibly bright. Um, it's got a lot of neon in it. There's also a lot of texture because I do think for me, the texture represents like the just different facets of like in, in the nuances of our lives and how hard that is to sort of capture without um, some kind of tactileness. Okay, keep, are you guys still with me? Everybody good? Yeah, we got smiles. Okay, great. Um, I don't see the chat, so um, just so you know. So moving on, uh, I'm, you know, thinking now, okay, uh, this role like of data and specifically within I mean, redlining, of course, but then now we have all of the police violence and the criminalization of innocent people. Um, data is feeding that, and it is really, really creating strange um, dynamics in neighborhoods. I know here in Detroit, we have this project called like the Green Light Project that literally like all the hood, you know, you're in the hood because there's like a green light that basically says, there's a surveillance camera here. Um, and that like messes with communities. And um, and I, I, so I was deeply thinking about that because one went up very close to my home. Um, and I was like, wow, there, what, what is this system? What does this system look like? That's under this underlying system. That's like crunching all the data that we have. And like looking at the legacy that capitalism plays to ensure like market growth and sustainability just keeps on crunching. So this these are my data crunchers. Um, and, and it really, I just wanted to use art as a way to like, like look deeply at the problem. I imagine these systems to be incredibly beautiful and really flawless and mesmerizing and look as if they're like, as you look at them, they sort of hypnotize you. That's the effect that I wanted with this quilt. It's also a twin size quilt. So it's fairly big. You can, it, it'll, you know, bigger than your body. And the idea is the colors to be so contrasty and the shininess of the ones and zeros in the background to create this illusion that you're sort of in the middle of this crunching that's happening and, and data is like all around you. 
So a uh, little close-ups for you. I don't know if you can see the ones and zeros in there, but they're they're really little in this one. So they the depth of field is is pretty uh is much more significant than when they're larger. Okay. So we're we're coming close to the end in case anyone's getting fatigued. Um I at this point in making these quilts, um got a lot better at quilting because <laughs> this one's really hard. <laughs> um, and I also now had a full visual language where I had the boxes to talk about systems, containment, as well as identity. I had a color scheme, not the crunchers to talk, you know, so I feel like this was the sort of summing up of the problem. And this quilt, quilt is called the system system. Uh, and for me, this it looks at the layers of categorization within data collection, um, systems that go on to shape our perspective, the, our decisions, identity, while creating a top-heavy power dynamic that allow big, big groups um, and big tech giants to function as gods, essentially. Um, and they're and they're shape and it's shaping life. Um, and and it's a strategy that they have you know, is intentional to ensure that we don't know how this stuff works. So a lot of my work I do like in the writing and the education and the, I know the work that you all do is really giving people the agency to make and to, to use technologies. And I think that's really, really important because we're so stuck in this kind of consumer phase of it. Um, and so I recall reading about there being literal formulas um, to deal with our outrage about certain technologies. And there's just a long history of like how we've sort of like rolled over um, for data collection that I don't want to get into now because like we only have like 15 more minutes left. Um, but yeah, it exists. And I just, I don't know, like they use these, this inform like these ideas called like anything's inevitable or this, this is going to happen regardless, so you must adopt it. And I find that so um, just like what, what some of the hard part is in breaking, breaking from this and having more agency than um, consumer. Right. So the thing that this quote does is if you notice in the upper left-hand corner, there's, um, and the lower left-hand corner, there are stars that are not fully built like there's like halfway there and they're kind of misaligned you'll also notice that there is a blue on blue like box that is a little bit out of the ordinary to like the middle right of the quilt um in a lot of quilt cultures that are very old you all they always had especially I recall reading in the Amish culture they always had a quilt block that kind of went to the side because the the idea was that only God is perfect, so you never made anything perfect. Um, and so for this, for me, learning from that, I was like, wow, like there, nothing is inevitable and nothing is singular. And there's always something, always something, there's always an anomaly for us to work within. And so those little moments in this quilt, for me, show the anomalies. And they also show that that to me is the work ahead, is to understanding the anomalies within the systems and to move like to, to use them to our advantage. And so what comes to me with this quote in particular is that your, your self-determination is stronger than any algorithm. And generally when I have like an exhibition, I like to make sure that that is on the wall next to this so that it shows that like, this is evidence that there are always loopholes for us to, to find. And so there's that, there's that cruncher that's not fully there in case you didn't catch it. And there's another cruncher that's not fully lined up. This quilt is really big. It is 88 by 94. So this quilt actually is like a king size quilt. Um, so I have like two, two more I'm going to show, and then I, I would love to hear your comments and questions. Um, so this one's called 
uh, I made this most recently. Um, this is called the data stream. So I got done looking at the problem, thinking about it, finding that inspiration of like the work to be done, which is why I, I so deeply appreciate um, the process of creativity and art as a way of discovering, but also as knowledge production. And this quote, I started looking at going deeper into that, what does life look like in data form? So this is sort of the close up of the data stream and it's all like piecemealed and patched together. And it's very, very big. It's like a, I don't know, a California King, it's huge. Um, so it can consume, like, I think like four people can go underneath it. Um, so it, when it's lit, well, it could, you really do feel like you're in a data stream. Um, and so this piece explores the effect of digitizing the world on f future generations who have an infinite stream of data to make sense of our lives, our cultures, and our beliefs. And so patches of our lives are like neatly organized and contained, making everyone uh, on the internet essentially immortal. And so the question that this brings up for me is like, in, in, in the idea of hope that this data collection can bring, is like, what will the future know about us that we are blind to today? And what is that, what we could learn about ourselves if we were looking at this in a non-consumer way? And here's some close-ups. And then I wanna leave you with one last quilt. Um, I'm gonna skip through one, so don't, don't get mad, ready? Okay, here we go. Oh, 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 we're skipping. Okay, okay. <laughs> I just want to respect time. Um, and I want to leave this on a hopeful, happy note because um, that's what's so important to like find solutions and build inspiration and get the youth of the future to like save this planet because we need hope. Um, so for me that this one is called landscapes of potential. Um, I started thinking uh, this is the culmination of all the ideas from using the visual language of the box as identity and the patchwork as, um, history. Um, to me, when I think about conjuring the future, I want to summon a relationship to the multiverse where, uh, it could be a cultural, like or, or physical, like evolving from segregated planes of existence to landscapes of potential. Um, I see this future forming as the recognition of the patterns that keep us from craving each other's differences. And I use this quote as evidence that our differences can live in harmony as chaotic as they are. And I will leave you with that. I'm going to let the applause come around and, and Scott, you can filter through here and let me know if there's anything else I'm missing. Um, but for first, I want to say thank you for that. And I'll also say like, since you haven't been watching the, um, the comments go by, there's a lot of love for you, for your work, for your messages, for your methods in the air. There's just a really, um, it was really great. And, and people really appreciated that. Um, I'll, I'll try to pull out a few of the questions here. Um, so the one I'm seeing here, I'll, 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 I'll paraphrase is do you see any potential for using uh, methodologies like this to help uh, address issues of polarization? Um, and this person is saying they often think it in terms of text for or for, for thinking about the ways you sort of um, uh, try to combat that or address that. And was wondering if there's methods that you think of that might be using sort of more materials to be able to address that. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for all the love, you guys. I'm like now just like scrolling through. I'm going to have to like read all this in a minute. So I appreciate, I, I can see that it resonated and that's always exciting. Um, uh, addressing the polarization is probably the hardest thing work we have again uh, ahead of us. I really think that last quilt and like using art as evidence and like trying to get people to imagine what it looks like to not have that exist, I think is where what what the work is and it can be. I generally, I sometimes do these quilting bees um, and I noticed that that's the quilt I skipped. Um, so, um, but <laughs> uh, the quilting bees, um, 
I've noticed that people, when they are using their hands, they are a lot, it's a lot easier to be vulnerable in using your head and thinking about really complex things. So in making, doing these sewing bees, I feel like there's a potential there to address and think about polar, like a world where polarization doesn't exist and to be able to use shape and color to, to bring that out. And I know that seems like so simple and like minute of a thing when there's like complete chaos happening in the world. But I do believe that it's like, you really need, you really need those visionary tools and you need that moment and pause of imagining something before you can actually actualize it. So I feel like the role of a sewing bee in my mind has a great potential to do that. And I hope that answers the question. Um, I see one. Uh, I'd love to hear more about what led to the evolution of your color template over time. So, you know, uh, I'm a color, I've always been a color free. I think it's because, like, I had like a rave moment, you know, like, <laughs> so I like love neon. I also am a, was born in the 80s. So, like, very informed by neon, um, very informed by just like the wildest of wild things of the 90s. Um, so, you know, of course, culture had shaped me, but, um, I also learned in playing with color that with it next to each other, it can change. And there's something that happens, um, similar to music when you're listening to music and it, it feels like it almost like it's feeling for you, or it can bring emotions out in you. Like a sad song can make you feel like you want to cry, even though you feel great or a happy song can like keep you keep your serotonin levels like pumped um so I do think color has the same effect when it's like intentionally chosen to put next to each other so I I really because I wanted to create these like almost like spiritual spaces to stare into the abyss of these textiles I chose to have opposite colors to play with colors that make your eyes like just go cross um, because that essentially is like um, an activation of that space, like through the eyes. Um, and what I mean by that space, the space of um, being able to like get transcended or something. Um, so yes, the evolution of it started from literally using black and white to learning about the power of color, reading a lot about it, and then building a color palette in my little quilt shop. Um, that then I, I refer back to because I do think consistency is, is important as well. So um, hopefully that answers your question. We're, we're pausing here to see a oh, question. How do you engage educational spaces with your work? Just like this. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, you know, used to, do so much educating and uh love like I love I love education is at, at the heart of me so everything I do it's embedded in there's nothing that won't have a message or something to think about there's games attached to these this work there's books attached to the work so through the work of um a people's guide to tech which is what I had referred to in the beginning of the talk with the AI zine um I feel like that's probably where the heavy like education goes it's like being able to put words to these ideas and then in the art realm is where I hit the emotional and the hand so it's like the head the heart and the hand I feel like are where I try to work with people um and yeah I think that um it just depends on on what's what's coming out but really what I love doing are the quilting bees to talk about stuff while people are doing craft with me Anybody else? Want Sorry, to... oh, there are questions here. I, I, a couple came up, and I'm trying to just sort them. Sorry. No problem. Um, I'm, I'm happy. There's lots uh, of there's questions. <laughs> uh, so, so Debbie asks, uh, I'm curious about the tensions in your quilt work and perhaps beyond. Some I observed heard between colors, pattern, and simplicity, lines and curves, solid and filled, building patterns, flat and dimensional, imprecision and precision. Yeah, you got it. Like. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you said it better than me. Um, I I feel like okay, so the tension, 
I like this question. The tension that I, I feel like I'm always dealing with is how to create that analog touchstone for mm-hmm. something that is completely invisible. Um, mm-hmm. So data collection, we don't feel it. We just don't feel it. Uh, the idea of our identities being boxed into an algorithm is like, we we don't feel it, We but we do experience it. Um, through just getting frustrated that we can't find anything to like watch or, or like listening to the same stuff. But so the, I think there's like a little more uh, ways in that can come out like as 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 we grow into like getting used to these things or becoming numb to them. Um, so I think that that's a big tension is to like bring light to the invisible. Um, and I also think that the big tension is that a lot of the things I talk about are really radical. I mean, I, I'm I'm talking about like essentially like taking down like decentralizing technology and taking down tech companies to like be able to like create things that are needed, not just consumed. Like I'm an anti capitalist, like talking about this stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like it's all like that that tension of 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 both fostering love while being political. Um, is always something I feel like I'm I'm navigating. Um, of course, I want to lead with love, but I can't do that without some kind of critical knowledge and and some kind of critical like lens. Um, so I do feel like that could be attention because of course I want things to just be beautiful and and feel good. Um, but I don't I don't know how f- in my experience and and what I feel like my purpose is is to inspire and to bring. Um, just some kind of words or or imagery to to the complex things that I I, I see and and show the way in which I can straddle between like artists and activists and even just like my own cultural heritage is always straddling things that like there is a perspective there uh, to bring out that always feels um, like a journey. Hopefully that all made sense. Um, I have one here uh, from Monica. The, the framing and focus on anomalies, rough edges, purposeful imperfections makes me think of Gaudi's architecture and the mm-hmm. idea that perfect or straight lines are not normal in nature. I wonder if you could talk more about the intentionality and thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Wow, to be compared to Gaudi is brilliant. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I feel like the thing of craft that, I love so <clears throat> also I guess there's a tension between art and craft always at play um what I believe mediums do um is they give you like it's sort of the kind of car you're driving like when you're the quilt is a uh like a real slow car <laughs> look it's an old beater this is gonna take you it's gonna take a long time to get there um whereas like making a tweet is like you know something that's like super fast I don't know what the new fast cars are but like a a formula one car or something like that um and so I think about mediums as a way of communicating and what and what they can can bring out um and I think that that mixing of mediums is like where and then also the mixing of opposites um which is maybe what the rough edges um, kind of comes out as is is where you find an in between of opposites. I'm I'm really hoping this all makes sense, but there's it's so for instance, hat talking about something digital with something so old uh, within a craft, like opens up this new form of thinking or realization, and that I feel like is like something that I'm always like really trying to dig dig for. Um, also within quilting, like the idea that like if something is impressive, um, you're more likely to pay attention to it. So this is why I go into the really intense technique because I recognize to get your attention, I have to do the work as well. Um, and so I take my craft very seriously. Um, and I'm constantly like, learning how to make more complicated things because I know that's what's going to get your attention and that's what's going to get you to respect me and I love it too like of course it's a twofer for all of us um but that is like I I hope that's getting to what you're asking about um uh in thinking about like I guess what was it the 
the roughness and the edges and the, the mixing of things that um, I think it's when you combine opposites is when you are able to sort of find new the new and I feel like I'm just always really looking for that. Cool. We're we're just about out of time, but I'll I'll, I'll there's one question still lingering here, and I'll I'll throw that one out, which is. Uh, curious to hear your reflection on how people engage with your quilts in comparison with other modalities you have used to communicate. Oh, um, mm, yeah, great question. I, I think the first thing that comes to mind is social media. Um, I think it's funny that they, it's the only place they really exist online and that's like what they're about. Um, that feels really radical to me and also poignant, but also like really hilarious and just <laughs> another opposite. Um, but I always uh, use like to come, like I use the my posting to share this as an organizing tool and that st begins my writing for these talks. Um, so I think that that way of communicating to the general public is what gets me like what are you trying to say like is what brings those questions so if you notice that each quote kind of has a, has a question attached to it um and i think like primarily sharing them online and on social media is like because i want people to walk away with with something to think about which is different than when you're in a gallery looking at these quilts you're going to walk away with a little bit more because there's texture there's color there's whatever your vibe is that day that you're dealing with. Um, and I, I just think like, of course, in person, they have m much more of an impact because um, they'll make your eyes feel weird. And, and um, but online, yes, I do think that that, that modality of, of sharing the work is where the questions emerge. Great, we are, we are just past time. So I'd like to thank you once again. and. Thanks everybody for all the great questions and and you should definitely I know you said you scrolled through a little bit but you should definitely look through the, the comments because there's a lot of great um thanks to you and and thanks to your work. Oh, thank you. Give me a second to to cut and paste them so I can Good, good. <laughs> I can look at them cuz it's always so wonderful to hear um from people. Thank you all so much for having me and like giving art a chance um in this moment and um yeah, I appreciate being here and being heard. Thank you. Thanks. And thanks to everybody for coming and thanks for making this a, a wonderful event. Please do fill out the um, the feedback form. We love to hear that. And we do make changes, um, quite a number of changes year to year. So we love to hear your feedback and, and know what we can do better next year. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye.